Yes, Mr. Dinelli. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, the next witness who I'll invite my learned friend to call is Ms. Hiang Forbes from ANZ. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Brasnell. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Ms. Forbes, would you prefer to take an oath or make an affirmation? Uh, take an oath, please. Yes, swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Do sit down, Ms. Forbes. Yes, Ms. Brasnell. Thank you, Commissioner. Your name is Hiang Forbes? Yes, it is. And your business address is 833 Collins Street, Docklands, in the state of Victoria? Yes, it is. And your current role is Pricing Operations <coughs> Chapter Lead at ANZ Banking Group? Yes, it is. And Ms Forbes, you've received a summons to appear before the Royal Commission today, haven't you? Yes, I have. Do you have a copy of it with you in the box? Yes, I do. Thank your you. Honour, uh, apologies, Commissioner, I tendered that document. Exhibit 1.121, summons to Forbes. Ms Forbes, you've prepared a witness statement for the purpose of giving evidence to the Commission today. Yes, I have. Do you have it with you in the box? Yes, I do. I note for the Commission's purpose that that is document number ANZ.999.001.002. Now, Ms Forbes, I understand there's a, a correction that you'd like to make to paragraph 58 of that statement. Yes, that's right. And if you just turn to that paragraph and let me know when you've reached it. In that paragraph, you wish to correct a typographical error. The date 15 January 2015 should actually be 15 January 2016. Is that correct? That's right. Could you make that change to the statement in front of you? Yes. And could you please initial that change? Now, Ms Forbes, with that correction, are the contents of your statement true and correct? They are. Commissioner, I tender that statement. Exhibit 1.122, witness statement of Ms Forbes. No questions for Ms Forbes, yes. Commissioner. Yes, Mr Dunnelly. Hello, Ms Forbes. My name's Albert Dunnelly and I'm one of the Council assisting the Royal Commission. Your current role at ANZ, Ms Forbes, is Pricing Operations Chapter Lead, is that right? That's correct. Um, can you describe that role for the Commission? My, my current role? Yes. Yep. So I manage a pricing operations desk. Um, so I've got a team of seven pricing operations experts and we receive uh, pricing requests um, and requests for pricing quotes for retail banking products. I see. And at, I'll come in a moment to the subject matter of, um, of your statement, but at the relevant time, uh, and when I um, refer to the relevant time, I'm referring to a period at the end of 2014 and the start of 2015. And you were a product manager for assured and overdrafts in personal loans and overdrafts between October 2014 and January 2016, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and can you describe, for the assistance of the Commission, what that role involved? Uh, so as a product manager, I was responsible for four products. So ANZ Assured, $500 and $1,000 limit, uh, the permanent overdraft and the temporary overdraft. Uh, so the key focus of a product manager is to make sure that the product uh, operates the way it's intended, uh, that the processes are working the way they should. Uh, our frontline staff members are able to understand the product uh, understand its features um, and also um, responsible for fulfilment of, of the product and making sure the processes work well. And does that involve marketing of the product as well? Uh, we work with a marketing team, yes. So as part of that you work with a marketing team who market relevantly the overdrafts? That's Now, your witness statement has been prepared, of course, to deal with an overdraft product called the ANZ Assured Overdraft Facility 
and certain pre-approved offers for that facility in 2014 and 15. Yes. Um, you had responsibility, your evidence is that during that time you had responsibility for two particular products and that is the ANZ assured $500 overdraft and the ANZ assured 1,000 overdraft uh, limit, is that right? That's correct. And can you explain how each of those, or perhaps we can start with those facilities, sure. um, how do each of them operate? Uh, they're essentially identical with the exception of the $500 and the $1,000 limit. Uh, so it is an overdraft that is an arrangement with the customer um, that is attached to an eligible ANZ account for the amount of either $500 or $1,000. So customers had to have an eligible ANZ account and then if they had this product on top of it, they could essentially um, go into debt to the bank either $500 if they had the $500 or 1000 if they had the 1000 Is that correct? Yes, it would be attached to their eligible ANZ account. Um, now in your statement, you say that it's intended to operate as a safety net to cover customers' small and temporary cash shortfalls, is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, and you also say that it's not designed to be used for a specific purpose or drawdown um, and paid back over an extended period of time, is that right? Yes, that's correct. What's the difference between this sort of overdraft facility that we've been referring to and what's called the informal overdraft facility that ANZ provides customers? It's my understanding that an informal overdraft facility is not a pre-arranged uh, overdraft facility. That's essentially the extent of my understanding of an informal. It may assist if I can take you to ANZ.800.255.785. Can you explain what this document is that's up on the screen at the moment, Ms Forbes? Uh, it's the Assured and Personal Overdraft Terms and Conditions document. You've got the screen beside oh, you, which I, I hope is easier to read for you. Um, and if, if I can take you to 7860 of that document. <coughs> There's a reference there to, at, at point eight, your linked account has an informal overdraft facility. The informal overdraft facility is a service provided by ANZ to give customers a convenient way to meet unplanned short-term borrowing needs. Do you see that? Uh, yes, I do. How's that different to the products that we've been referring to, Ms Forbes? It's different in that it's not a pre-arranged credit facility. Uh, so it's, it's an informal overdraft, if you like. So it's not something that uh, is known or, or pre sorry, pre-arranged with the customer. Okay, so if you have this account, according to the terms and conditions, I go to um, point eight and I, say, I look at this and I say, uh, my linked account has an informal overdraft facility. Uh, and that gives me a convenient way to meet unplanned short-term borrowing needs. Is that right? Uh, that's what it states there, yes. Um, and you would agree certainly that that's something that ANZ, um, uh, that's akin to or similar to the um, the product we've been talking about, the $500 and $1,000 overdraft? Uh, it's, it's not one of the products that I managed, but it, it does have similarities. Once a person has a, an overdraft, whether it be one by way of an informal one or, um, or the $500 or $1,000, you'd agree that it's not how people use that is not something that ANZ can control. It can be used for anything that the person purchases. Yes, the, the intent of the assured overdraft is to act as a safety net um, and to provide cover for short-term uh, discrete uh, instances. 
and which is the same as I understand it as the informal overdraft. That's what that's intended to do too, according to the terms and conditions. Uh, yes, it looks that way. And once the customer starts using an overdraft facility, interest starts accruing, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, what was the interest rate, if I go to that particular time, what sort of interest rate did um, uh, the ANZ assured product have? This um, is end 14, start 15, is it? Sorry? End 2014, yes. start 2015. Sorry. Yes. Uh, from memory, it was about 17%. And was there also an annual fee that was required to be paid in monthly instalments? Uh, on the ANZ Assured, yes. Yes, there was. Um, and for that relevant period, 2014, 2015, ANZ was sending out unsolicited, or sent out some unsolicited, that is they weren't requested, pre-approved offers for either the 500 or the 1,000 assured overdraft. Is that right? Yes, it did. Um, you say in your statement that you sent around, uh, you, ANZ, sent 330,000 of those. Is that right? In 2014? Yes. So uh, in my statement, it, uh, it, it mentions that for the year 2014, 330,000 odd uh, assured offers were sent out. Um, do you know how many approximately took up those offers? Uh, I would have to check uh, um, my statement. It's about, and it's not a memory test, but at um, paragraph um, 68, you mm -hmm. say that 2,992 um, ANZ assured facilities were taken up in the period between 10 November 2014 and 27 February 2015. Do you see that? Yes, yes I do. And that's right, is it? Uh, yes, that's correct, for that time period. And when did ANZ stop sending the um, these pre-approved offers? Uh, the pre-approved offers ceased in January 2015. So the last letters were sent out on the 27th of January. Uh, the There's a 30-day offer period, so the last date in which they could be accepted was the 27th of February, 2015. I see. Now, given your experience and extensive experience at ANZ, you'd be familiar that um, ANZ must and was certainly required to, at the relevant time, do certain things before entering into a contract with someone? Yes, I am aware. Um, Those obligations include making reasonable inquiries about a customer's financial situation? Yes. Um, taking reasonable steps to verify that information? Um, and making an assessment whether the credit contract here, an overdraft facility, would be suitable or unsuitable for the customer? Yes. Now that comes from, as you know, um, the National Credit Act. I might um, call that up briefly, RCD.0022.0001.0001. And go to page 0099. Yes, yep. <coughs> And if you can take it from me, Ms Forbes, that the purposes of paragraph 128D, that provides certain things that a licensee that ANZ must do. It says it must do the things in section 130. And a licensee, so ANZ, must, before making an assessment, do various things. One is make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's requirements and objectives in relation to a credit contract. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and you understand um, that that means um, that there must be inquiries um, made by the ANZ um, in relation to what the consumer requires for um, the credit contract, for the purposes for which the consumer requires the credit contract? Could, sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. 
um, that's my fault, Ms Forbes. Um, 1A provides that ANZ must make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract. Yes. Um, and D, make any requiries prescribed by regulations about any matter prescribed by the regulation. So there's also, as I'm sure you're aware, a set of regulations, and I might take you to that. It's RCD.0022.0002.0001. Um, so these are the National Consumer Credit Protection Regulations. Now this is not a, a legal exam, Ms Forbes, but if you go to, sorry, if the operator could kindly go to 0 0.0104. You'll see there that for the, for the purposes of paragraph 131D of the Act, that was what I took you to before, a licensee must make reasonable inquiries about the maximum credit limit that a consumer requires. Do you see that? Yes. And that um, suggests that relevantly, ANZ must do that thing, doesn't it? Uh, according to, to that. Yeah, but well, it doesn't say only if ANZ thinks it might be relevant. Uh, there is mention of reasonable inquiries there. Um. Yes, so it must make reasonable inquiries. So that, or would you agree with me that it means that licensee must make um, some inquiries and those inquiries must be reasonable. Uh, yes, that's what it states. Um, and so you're, uh, it's not intended, as I said, to be um, a law class, but having taken you through that, none of that comes as a surprise to you, does it? You're familiar with those obligations? Um, in preparation for the Commission in this hearing, uh, I, I have made myself aware much more closely to the obligations, yes. Um, well, in, uh, thank you. And I, maybe I can take you to the ANZ, to ANZ's credit card, which basically mirrors these obligations. They're part of your statement. Uh, ANZ.800.077.0001. I think you said credit card, it's the credit guide. Credit guide, thank you, yeah. Commissioner. I'm sorry I've got credit cards on the mind. Uh, <coughs> can you perhaps explain what the ANZ credit guide is, Ms Forbes? Uh, it's something that's handed out to customers when they do take up a credit product or a, a product. Um, and it's intended to outline information about the credit. I see. Yeah. Um, if I could take you to point oh one oh seven, so the second page. Um, and you'll see that um, there's a heading, our obligations before providing credit to you. Mm -hmm. We are prohibited by law from providing credit that is unsuitable for you. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you see that it says... Um, in the section that follows, this means before we provide you credit, we must make an assessment that you can meet your financial obligations under the credit contract without substantial hardship and the credit meets your requirements and objectives. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, relevantly, can I take you to this? It then says, to help us to make this assessment, we will, first off point, make inquiries about your financial situation and requirements and objectives that we believe are relevant to the credit you are applying for. Do you see that? Yes. If you go, if you remember what we were talking about before, it seems that that refers to something that wasn't in the provisions we looked at. That is, it doesn't re refer to that we believe are relevant. Do you see the distinction between what's there and what was in the what I showed you before? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Do you notice that? Do you notice that it says mm -hmm. that we believe are relevant to the credit you are applying for? Yes. That language wasn't in the sections I showed you, was it? 
Not uh, in the exact words, no. Do you think that the requirement to make reasonable inquiries can be fulfilled without asking the client anything? Uh, it's, a, it's a broad question. Um, it, I, I suppose it depends on the circumstances uh, that's a, that are in play. So it says that, um, so you agreed with me before that broadly the I shouldn't be brought up with raw that. You agreed with me previously that there's a, a requirement to make reasonable inquiries um, before um, a credit contract is entered into, reasonable inquiries as to what the purpose of the contract is. Do you recall that? Uh, yes. How is it said, or perhaps I should say it in this way, how is it said that you can make reasonable inquiries if you don't make any inquiries? That a very fair question to put to Mr. Dinelli. Perhaps not. The either, the, either the point's good or it's bad, and I'm not sure that I get anywhere by her. No, I accept that. I would throw the question. Agreeing or disagreeing with it. Uh, <coughs> do you think, perhaps I'll put it this way, Ms. Forbes, do you mm. think that the customer's requirements and objectives can be assessed without asking the client about their requirements and objectives? Uh, I think if I link this back to the ANZ Assured offers that were sent out, which is, I think, the subject of uh, my witness statement. So the purpose of the offers uh, that were sent out or, or the um, inquiries that were made were, in our minds at the time, reasonable due to the intended purpose um, of, an a of the ANZ Assured product that we uh, owned and managed and sold. Um, and also the size of the limit uh, being 500 or or $1,000. It was deemed reasonable and scalable. And we'll come back to that language in a moment. But let's go to that letter, in fairness. You've, so ANZ.800.255.7837. Is this one of the, there's a number of examples, and I, I might take you to a couple of them, but this is one of the ones that you had in mind? Ah, uh, yeah, that's correct. And it says here, it says, this is obviously a sample, dear Mr. Sam, uh, Mr. Sample, then the first paragraph is, based on our assessment of your ANZ accounts, we would like to offer you an ANZ assured 500 credit facility with no application fee and a low monthly fee of approximately $5. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and if you go then down slightly, you sh it says you should read the letter of offer overleaf and the terms and conditions booklet. But after that's done, the good news is that with ANZ Assured, you're already approved. Do you see that? Yes. You saw previously it said um, uh, that you've been, in fact, in large type, you've, you're pre-selected for ANZ um, Assured. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and it says there's no application fee. Yep. Well, it's not an application, is it? There was no application made. No. And activation is quick and simple. And one phone call is all it takes. That's correct. And then it says you only pay interest on the credit you use. That's correct. Why would a customer pay for credit they don't use? It might be said. Um, that's all right, so. Um, now, if you go down slightly, um, a little well, bit that, further. At that time, did ANZ charge unused limit fees on some overdrafts? The monthly fee would be charged regardless of whether the limit was actually drawn down upon or, you, or used. Um, we didn't call it that, though. You didn't call it an we unused limit it. fee, but uh, no. there was in a effect, would fee. it be an unused limit fee? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think it operates maybe. the same way, Commissioner. Yeah. Maybe inaccurate, but... Uh, there was a fee, yes. And that was the $5 a month fee that we saw on this, isn't it, Ms Forbes? Yes. Sorry, we'll go down a little bit more if we could. You see here it says, um, and I might, in fairness to everyone being able to see that, it says, um, I, we have read the ANZ assured letter of offer. And then the next thing is, sorry, not the next, um, but the third thing is, I, we also confirm that I, we can repay this credit limit of $500 without substantial hardship. Do you see that? Yes. And then there's a note, if your personal circumstances have recently changed or are likely to change in the near future in a way that could adversely affect your financial position, please don't, do not accept this offer, but call us. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, because no inquiry had been made before this offer was sent as to the customer's personal circumstances, had they? The inquiries that... Uh led to a customer being uh, sent a pre-approved offer, covered off a number of different elements that ANZ had uh, information about. So if I can go into that uh, at this point. Can I, can I put it perhaps as a, we will come to that. Okay. But am I, am I right to say that before this letter, however, no inquiry had been made reasonable or otherwise, no inquiry had been made as to the purpose for which the person required, or indeed if they did require, a credit contract? Not specifically to purpose, no. Um, but the intention, mm -hmm. as mentioned before, is that the ANZ Assured product is uh, for temporary shortfalls. I understand that that's what you say the purpose of the product is, but the question I'm getting at is, a do you, the, the, I'm coming at it from the other side, from the side of the consumer, the receiving this, they haven't said to ANZ anything about what their requirements, um, what their requirements are um, for a credit contract, have they? Uh, no. If one, if I go to RCD point zero zero two, sorry, RCD point zero zero two two point zero 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 one point zero 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 one. Sorry, I think I've given the wrong. Sorry, I've taken you to the wrong thing. Excuse me, Ms. Forbes. Now we referred earlier, you referred earlier to the processes that occurred at ANZ before these letters was, were sent and you deal with them in your statement. Now some of the statement is confidential because it involves the processes applied by ANZ um, and I'll ask you about some of those things at a high level okay. so that we don't disclose that confidentiality Thank you. Um, unnecessarily or improperly. Um, am I right to say that the process of inquiries and verification criteria considered what amounts were paid into an ANZ account? Is that right? Uh, that is an element, yes, that's correct. And also consideration of other ANZ um, accounts and their use over the previous um, 12 months? Yeah, I, I believe the 12 months. I'd have to confirm that, though. I think there's I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Ms Forbes, you dropped your voice. Oh, I'm, I apologise. No, 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 yeah. just, just can you give me the answer you gave again? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, 
There is a review of transaction history. Uh, the 12 months, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, so right, I'll sure. have to check. Um, and look, nothing turns on it, but if we could just, but it is right to say one looks at the ANZ accounts broadly for a period preceding the making of the offer. Uh, yes, that's correct. But in so doing, there's no reference to uh, any other financial information um, that might be relevant to um, might be relevant to the person other than their ANZ history. Is there? Uh, as far as the ANZ assured is concerned, in terms of the accounts that it's eligible to be linked to, uh, it's not able to be linked to the ANZ basic account or if the customers or at the time was part of the ANZ Saver Plus program. So those accounts are used and, and sold to customers who are receiving Centrelink benefits or, or benefits, if you like. So it, it does, I think, so look it's at you, those you, circumstances. So it's your evidence that the people who get offered these, um, the people who get offered these, uh, or at the relevant time are offered the 500 or $1,000, weren't, for example, and use the example of Centrelink benefits because they wouldn't have had that particular account. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And when we were talking previously about the requirements to make reasonable inquiries, you, you recall that that requires lenders to seek information from from a customer and it wouldn't in and of itself be enough just to just to consider what accounts it had with ANZ and no other details. I understand that now, yes. Um, and likewise, ANZ didn't have any idea if the customer needed, as in required um, or wanted or actually wanted, as in, I, I want to have a overdraft. ANZ made no um, inquiries to that, did it, before sending the letters? Uh, no, no. It's a complementary uh, product. Well, when you say it's complementary, um, it, it is a credit contract, though, is it not? Yes, it is. So once a person was filtered for eligibility using these references within ANZ system. Then if one went through that process and there was no ineligibility, um, it would, ANZ would um, send the letter to the relevant people offering them that um, overdraft, is that right? Uh, there was also an element of uh, transaction inquiry that that we mentioned before. Yes. So are you including that in, in that process? Yes, there is. Um, and again, without delving too deeply into the, some matters that ought not be disclosed, but there was consideration of amounts that had gone into ANZ accounts. Yes. Um, but nothing was asked about, for example, um, if a customer had... Um, dependents or what their work status was at the time? Uh, not for the offers, not at the time, no. Nothing about any potential changes coming up in their lives if they were ill? Uh, apart from the statement that we saw at the bottom of the activation form. See? Um, in fact, is it a fair summary of paragraph 38 without disclosing its precise terms that what you were considering was the credit worthiness of the person in so far as their ANZ accounts is concerned? Uh, yes. And not, and not the customer's needs or requirements? No, that's, that's, sorry, that's correct. Now, once the offer's sent, so the pre-approved offer is sent, if someone responds to accept it, am I right to say that the check, the only check that is then placed on it is 
or there's two checks, I should say, in fairness to you, mm -hmm. that once they communicate their acceptance, ANZ staff would first check if the offer had not expired? That's correct. So if the offer had not expired and it was still capable of being um, accepted, it would be accepted, save and accept that you say that if there was a hardship flag on the customer's account, which would prevent the product from being activated, um, that would prevent its acceptance. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and there would only be a harm ship, a hardship flag if the customer had himself or herself contacted ANZ to that effect, wouldn't they? Uh, that's correct. So in the time between the offer having been sent through to when they chose to accept, if, if that flag had been loaded in that time, that's to make sure that we don't load the limit or activate the limit I see. for the customer. But otherwise, the check that is done is just to make sure that the, the date, the expiry date of the offer hasn't expired. That's the first check. Thank you. Two. Now, <clears throat> I'm right in saying now, and you give some evidence about this, that the application form for overdrafts has now changed. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and in fact, um, a question that's asked is, usually we suggest ANZ assured to provide cover for temporary unexpected expenses arising on your eligible account. Is this what you are planning to use the ANZ assured for? And the customer is given the option of answering yes or no. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but if you I go to paragraph seven, uh, 71A of your statement, um, I, you've probably got a copy there and it's up on the screen. 71. You can see that one of the questions that I asked you previously was whether or not ANZ asked about why the person wanted the ANZ assured product. You yes. recall that? Yes, I do. And that no questions were asked about that by ANZ at the relevant time? Yes. Um, and a question is now asked um, in the terms of 71A1. You see that? Yes, I do. Can I? take you to some of the um, some of the correspondence that's at um, that's exhibited to your statement in particular at H1 in fact the first document which is ANZ.800.077.0001 Um, have you seen this letter before? I have. Sorry, this is exhibited to your statement. Um, what, um, this letter is a letter from um, ASIC to ANZ about this, um, uh, the ANZ Assured product. Do you see that? Yes. And you see that, um, that some of the terms that we've already discussed um, this, mo this afternoon um, I referred to there, you're already approved, activation is simple and quick. Do you see that? Yes. And a series of questions are asked of, um, of ANZ in that letter, That's including correct. how ANZ, number five, how ANZ complies with each of its obligations in subsection 130, subsection one of the National Consumer Credit Protection Act in relation to its unsolicited offers for an ANZ assured overdraft. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, a response was sent to that letter by, which is the next document, which I'll go to perhaps um, before lunch, if that's convenient. Um, ANZ.800.255.7833. And you see that one of your, or two of your colleagues, I should say, Mr Shaw, Mark Shaw and Bob Ballon responded, if you can take my word for it, that they signed the letter. Yeah. They responded to 
uh, Mr. Thompson at ASIC. Yes. And there's an explanation there about um, the product. And can I take you specifically to one aspect of it? And that's at um, question five on page 7835. Now, you'll recall that this question was how ANZ complied with subsection 130, subsection 1, to make um, reasonable inquiries about the consumer's requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract. And you'll see that at 5A. Can you see that? Yes. And the answer that's given is an ANZ assured overdraft is a small line of credit which may be used for a wide range of reasons with no particular purpose. Do you see that? Yes, I do. That doesn't really answer the question, does it? Not in black and white, no. Um, oh, it, in, in neither black or white nor any other colour, it doesn't answer the question, does it, Ms Forbes? No, it doesn't, that's right. Commissioner, is that a convenient sure, time? Ms Forbes, we'll have to ask you to come back after lunch if you can be back in time to resume at 2pm. Adjourn until 2 p.m. And in the last um, paragraph on that page, if I can take you to it, uh, it says ANZ's position. If we go down to the third line, it's put the requirement to make inquiries into the consumers' requirements and objectives would be limited. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, but it seems that um, limited though they may be, there still needs to be some inquiries that are made, don't there? Uh, according to the Act, yes. Yes, there does. Thank you. And if you go to the next page... Um, and it's the second paragraph. You say, um, ANZ, or sorry, ANZ said, ANZ's inquiries into a customer's financial situation for the overdraft offers <laughs> were tailored to the nature of the product. We do not consider the process adopted for the assessment of overdraft offers was an example of ANZ scaling down inquiries due to the amount of credit offered. What do you mean by scaling down there? There were no inquiries made. Uh, according to the criteria that was used to build the offers, I believe that's what that's in relation to. But insofar as, is it, is it your position, is what you're intending to say that because of the amount in issue, ANZ could scale down its inquiries such that it wasn't necessary to even ask if the person required or desired that particular product. Um, I didn't write uh, the letter, so I'm, un I'm actually unsure about the intent of that, I see. Of that sentence. I see. Um, and you've, well, you've given evidence that, um, that no inquiries um, were made in that regard and in that um, and you you wouldn't you wouldn't or it's not your language to use the ANZ scaling down inquiries uh, that's not my language no um, if we could go down a little bit further please That's fine. I might take you, if I may, to another piece of correspondence briefly. Um, <clears throat> that is ANZ.800.255.9420. Before I take you to that letter, Ms Forbes, the pre-approved letter offers 
that was a, a major plank, was it not, of um, the marketing of um, the assured overdraft? Uh, it was the only form of marketing in place for the overdraft. Thank you. Uh, so the sending of these letters was important, was, in, was um, an important way for the bank to increase the uptake of this particular product? Uh, it was the only way that we did uh, market the product. I see. Um, and on the second page, you said, sorry, ANZ sets out, um, if I go to the next page, or sorry, the third page of this document. Bear with me for a moment. Um, do you have a copy of your statement before you? I do, yes. Um, I'll have to take you to it because unfortunately there's um, some confidentiality on this. Uh, maybe it's the third page actually. This, so 0003, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and ANZ, I think it's fair to say, sent quite a lot of letters um, in the form of pre-approved offers over the years, didn't it? Uh, yes, the numbers state Yeah, state so, there. Um, so in 2011 there was nearly 600,000, 2012, 243,000, 2013, 372,000 and 2014, 330,000. That's correct, yes. Now, in a later letter you identified how many were, um, how many of those offers were actually accepted. Um, so that's ANZ.800.077.001. In fact, I'll wait for that to come up. Sorry, Ms. Forbes, Commissioner. Um, ANZ.800.077.0033. This was in response to a notice that you had received um, from the Australian from, from ASIC under Section 49 of the Act, which enables certain questions to be put to licensees. Mm -hmm. um, on the next page, if I can take you to 0034. Um, during the course of the relevant period, that is 10 November 2014 to 27 February 2015, um, is it right that 2,992 2 offers were accepted? Uh, there's a, the, you, those figures can be ignored and in fact we could put the screen down, but if you go to paragraph 68 that accords with your um, that accords with your evidence at paragraph 68. <coughs> yes, that's correct. And, and that, however, was for a, a period of approximately three months, or yes. um, three and a half months, half perhaps? Half months, yes. Now, you say um, in your evidence that 
it's not possible to definitively determine which offers were activated as a direct result of the customer accepting a pre-approved offer? That's correct. Um, is it not the case that um, these offers that were accepted, sorry, is it not the case that um, during that period, the amount of offers that were accepted were all accepted in relation, in response to the pre-approved offers? Sorry, could you reword? Is it not the case that the 2,992 offers were all in response to the pre-approved offers? That's correct, yes. That's what that number is referring to. And in fact, that's one of the ways that, um, that you would assess your marketing to work out if it's working to measure the number of people who accepted a particular invitation or offer in this case? Uh, that's something that the marketing and the analytics teams would uh, use to monitor the, the, I guess, the uptake. I see. Um, at, you go on to say that during your time as a product manager, the pre-approved offers typically had a low, low levels of acceptance. Um, is it right to say um, that they were low levels of acceptance in circumstances where there was that many people in a period of three months? That is nearly 3,000 people in three months. I think the low level of acceptance would is referring to the numbers purely the numbers so what was sent out and then what was activated um, there wasn't a target success rate or a or an acceptance rate uh, but as you said that was the 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 only form of marketing that was used in respect of that particular product that's correct and I take you briefly to ANZ.800.255.879. <coughs> and this letter. ASIC noted that if ANZ had complied with its obligations, ANZ might have found that the product was unsuitable for some customers or it may have, uh, ANZ may have provided them a lower limit. Uh, um, yes, that's what it, that's in the letter, yes. Um, and ASIC, is, well that, first of all, as a proposition, sounds reasonable, does it not? If, if ANZ had asked, if people wanted this product or desired this product and had regard to their particular requirements, ANZ might have found that the product was unsuitable for some of those customers. Uh, yes, that's... M might have, for example, instead of $1,000 said, oh, well, actually, for this particular person, $500 is more appropriate. It, it could have been the case, yes. Um, and ASIC in that letter said that it considered it appropriate for ANZ to review the facilities in order to remediate customers who might be in that circumstance. Sorry, I might to ask the, um, to go to the next page. They can put them next to each other. Could, is it possible to put them next to each other, please? And you'll see just above response required, that paragraph says, we consider that it's appropriate for ANZ to undertake a review of the ANZ assured facilities provided in order to remediate customers who ought not have been provided with the facility or only provided with a facility with a lower credit limit. That sounds pretty reasonable too, does it not, Ms Forbes? Uh, yes, I can, I can see that there and yes. And then there's a response given on behalf of ANZ at ANZ.800.077.0172.
And on the second page, again, I'll ask, thank you. I think it might be the third page, actually, 0174. ANZ um, there said that ANZ is not clear on the basis of such a remediation program. Mm -hmm. Sorry, maybe I can start. ASIC has asked ANZ to review the ANZ assured facilities for the purpose of identifying and remediating customers. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Who ought not to have been provided the facility or ought to have been provided with a lower credit limit. ANZ is not clear on the basis of such a remediation program. And then they go on to explain some of the changes that have been made. And then, however, notwithstanding our view of previous processes, ANZ would like to meet with you to seek to further understand ASIC's concerns and why ASIC believes a remediation is required. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and did that meeting occur? Uh, I'm not aware of whether a meeting has it had occurred. Um, I was not in the role at that time. I see. Uh, the next thing that you refer to in terms of chronologically in your materials is a letter dated the, um, the 10th of January, and you referred to that in your, um, in your um, statement, do you recall? Yes. And I'll come to that um, in a moment. So there was clearly an impasse of sorts between ANZ um, and ASIC, but what happened in the interim, and I am jumping in terms of dates for which I apologise, but at the start of 2006 an infringement notice was given to ANZ, you're aware of that? Sorry, yes, what I am. Year? At the start of 2016, the 5th Thank of February. <coughs> slightly Excuse out of order, Commissioner, but if one goes to ANZ.800.255.9022, And you'll see that this notice was uh, was given to ANZ, an infringement notice, which set out that, and I'm the third paragraph, during the period 10 November 2014 to 27 February 2015. That's the relevant period, isn't it, Ms Forbes? Yes, it is. Uh, and there's then reference to you engaging conduct contrary to section 128. We discussed that section and I took you to section 130. Um, without, in the final words, without pursuant to section 128 having made the inquiries and verification in accordance with section 132 of the Act, in particular regulation 28JA. Do you see that? I do, yes. And those, and there were four infringement notices in that form, weren't there? Oh, you take the five. Um, I think it might be five. You're right, Miss Forbes. Um, that were issued, and they were all issued <coughs> at that time, weren't they? They were. And all dealt with the same conduct. That is the conduct of the pre-approved credit offers, the overdraft uh, offers. Yes, it did. I said that I'd come back to it, and I will now. You refer um, to the ASIC letter of 10 January 2017. Do you remember that letter? Um, this is the last letter that you refer to, and you actually refer to it in your statement. Yes. On two occasions, <clears throat> um, at paragraph 65. In your statement of paragraph 65, you say, on about 10 January 2017, do you see that? Yes, I do. And the, you quote part of that letter. The letter also stated that on the basis of the information provided and the changes the ANZ has made, we do not propose to make any further inquiries at, that, at this time. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you repeat that, if you go to paragraph 73, where you again quote that part um, of the letter. Can you see that? Yes, I do. But 
the letter dealt with another issue, didn't it, Ms Forbes? Uh, what do you mean? Um, if we go to the letter... Yes, please. ...itself, which is ANZ.800.255.8807... You've, in your witness statement to this commission, referred to the, s the last substantive paragraph there on the basis of the information provided. But previously, the letter said, we ask that the ANZ provide remediation on a case-by-case -case basis to ANZ-assured customers approved via the ANZ's previous application process, in response, bracket, in response to pre-approved ANZ-assured offers, close bracket. Yes. For example, in determining what action the ANZ should take in response to any hardship, arrears default by these customers, we seek that ANZ assess whether the income and expenses used by ANZ in its unsuitability assessment reflected the customer's actual financial situation and provide appropriate remediation. Yes. You didn't refer to that in your statement though, did you? Uh, no, it wasn't in my statement. In fact, in your statement, you were also asked, and you'll recall, you receive, ANZ received um, an outline of, an, uh, of some answers that were required in a statement. Do you recall seeing that for the purposes of this commission? The questions the questions the study? That ultimately became your statement? Yes. One of the questions, if you go to page 10 of your statement, Um, I'm sorry, I'll have to go to um, at, you see the questions, question 10 and question 11? Yes, I do. Question 11 says, explain how and when ANZ communicated with those customers and what was communicated. Do you see that question? Yes, I do. You didn't answer that question in your statement, did you? Uh, no, that wasn't addressed in my statement. I'm sorry, mm. Ms Forbes, you'll I'm have sorry. to repeat your answer. What was your <clears throat> answer? No, I didn't address that in my statement. Yes. That's because ANZ has never communicated with any of the customers affected by these pre-approved offer letters, has it? Uh, if I can refer to my answer to question 10, if that's OK. Um, we... The response there is that we haven't been able to readily identify the number of customers who have been impacted uh, by our failure to inquire about a maximum credit limit. Um, the information that we do hold with respect to hardship and complaints information is very difficult to link back the, uh, the failure uh, to inquire about a maximum credit limit. Um, back to uh, any hardship or, or um, any uh, collections activity um, experienced by the customer, unless it's specifically advised to us. Okay. Have you told ASIC that? Uh, I don't believe, I'm not aware of any communications to that effect to ASIC. And you'd um, you'd agree with me that if that's the case, there haven't been any inquiries made, f for example, of even the five people who were subject of the infringement notices? Uh, I'm not aware of any inquiries of the five people. Um, it, ANZ hasn't monitored whether people who were offered these pre-approved um, offers and accepted them <coughs> are constantly in arrears or paying huge sums? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any monitoring. Um, and, I'm and in relation to the ones the subject of the relevant period, or in fact any of the pre-approved offers that have been given? No, I'm not aware of any monitoring. And those, sorry, I, I referred to the people who were subject to the infringement notices. Were they ever remediated, those people? Not to my knowledge. Um, it is ANZ's position, is it not, that there ought be no remediation, is that right? I, I'm not sure about ANZ's position on this. Um, we do have hardship teams and, and teams that do uh, hear from customers 
um, and are able to deal with uh, any such situations as they arise. Yep, go tell me. Yep. Um, Would you want to go to the other one? This one is a. Why don't I have to go to the other one? Um, in fact, if I can go to RCD.0001.0035.0088. Have you, um, have you seen this document before, Ms Forbes? I have. Uh, mm -hmm. um, this is ANZ's response to a letter, or the second letter, as it's been described, of the Commission dated the 2nd of February. Do you see at 1.2a it says that, um, helpfully, ANZ has gone through this material and sh shaded some of the material that we'll come to in a moment, and that relevantly, three says certain. So part one contains in tabular form the further detail sought by the commission concerning, and I'll jump ahead to three, certain instances where a question of misconduct has arisen, but has, but not been determined. Thank you. And in the time available, ANZ has been unable to determine whether there has been misconduct but has disclosed the matter to assist the Commission with its work. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And it's denoted by pink shading. <coughs> yes. If I can go to point zero one two eight. <coughs> Excuse me. Just about there, I think. And item 153, perhaps if that could um, be expanded, Mr. Ayer. Um And this, uh, this is what we've been talking about this afternoon, isn't it, Ms. Forbes? Uh, yes, that's correct. That's right. Yes. And um, and the the pink shading suggests that. Um, that it hasn't been determined here by ANZ and, and ANZ has been unable to determine whether there has been misconduct in this circumstance. Are you aware of that? Uh, I am. I've seen this. Um, and uh, just as a response to this, is the payment of the infringement notices uh, by ANZ wasn't an admission of uh, any contravention of, of the Act, uh, hence the pink when, um Sorry, you wanted to say something else? Uh, were you cut off? No, no. I wasn't. No. Sorry, Ms. Falls. Sorry, I'm speaking very softly. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're aware that, um, that ASIC asked ANZ on numerous occasions about remediation, didn't it? I uh, recall two occasions. From memory. Um, and in fact, there was a response to that, um, to the letter um, that's the last letter um, in exhibit um, HF1, so the letter dated the 10th of January. Um, are you aware that there was a response to that? Uh, uh, I don't believe I've seen that, no. Uh, and well, I'll show you. Okay. Um, it's ASIC.0012.0003.1673.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001
you didn't put this email in um, in your statement, did you? No, I didn't. Are you aware whether or not it's been provided to the Commission by ANZ? I'm actually not aware, no. Can I tender that, please? Yes, and what about ANZ's response to the and two February 18 inquiry? Yes, both, uh, of, both if I may. I'm I, sorry. Item 153, uh, in ANZ's response to 2nd February 18 inquiry, RCD 0001-0035-0088 will be Exhibit 1.123. Uh, exhibit 1.124 will be... Uh, email ANZ to ASIC 19 January 17, ASIC 0012-003-1696. Thank you. <coughs> um, so you're not aware of any further communication from ANZ to ASIC? No, I'm not. Um, and there's been um, no acknowledgement of any misconduct by ASIC after this letter, as far as you're aware? Conduct by ASIC? <laughs> You asked conduct. whether there was acknowledgement of misconduct by ASIC. By, by ANZ, I'm sorry, thank you, Commissioner. That's right. Has there been any acknowledgement of misconduct by ANZ after the 19th of January 2017? Not that I'm aware of, no. That's it, yeah. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. Forbes. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Dinelli. Does any party other than uh, ANZ seek leave to cross examine Ms. Forbes? Yes, Ms. Brasnell. No questions, Commissioner. Ms Brasnor, um, you don't answer this if it will embarrass you, but at the moment I'm left with uh, a question which this witness could not answer about whether uh, Exhibit 1.124 had been produced by ASIC. Now, uh, that may be a matter that uh, uh, you want to take on notice, it may be a matter that you don't want to answer at all, but uh, I simply note that a question was asked, this witness couldn't answer it. So Commissioner, just to clarify, produced by ANZ rather than ASIC? Uh, not produced by ANZ. If I said ASIC, I'm falling for the trap Mr. Donnelly did. Thank you, Commissioner. Noted. Yes, thank you. Very well, thank you, Ms. Forbes. You're excused further attendance. <coughs>